Great to be here on this sunny day in LA. I'm Katie Roof. I'm the tech deals reporter for Bloomberg, which means I've been busy. And I'm joined by Andrew Chen, who's a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, where he invests in consumer. And he also authored a book called uh, The Cold Start Problem. So great to be here. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So let's start out by talking about what the cold start problem is. You used to lead rider growth at Uber, and you learned a lot about the trajectory of startups going from zero to one. So what is the cold start problem? Yes, well, the, one of the most interesting things um, working in tech has been to see the, the, this force that is behind many of the, the, the biggest outcomes in whether you're talking about social apps or marketplaces or um, a lot that's happening in, in multiplayer games, which is the idea of network effects, which is the idea that as products uh, gain more users, that inevitably they become um, even more valuable and useful over time. Um, and so this is such an important thing. It's really the core thesis of how we do investing at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, but one of the one of the interesting and, and, and most difficult parts of, um, of of executing this kind of a strategy is the fact that in the early days you just don't have enough users to, to have the product a product be useful. If you're going to um, build a new social app that's a new you know photo sharing or video sharing app, if there's not enough users, um, even if you have all the features that you're looking for, what ends up happening is uh, in, inevitably, the, 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 the product is just, you know, the users just, are just going to bounce as a result. Same thing with marketplace companies. You know, one of the things that I observed at, um, at Uber had been um, you can get into this vicious spiral where if you don't have enough drivers in a particular city and, um, and, and then your ETAs are, are way too high right now in LA, for example, they're, they're, they're pretty bad. Um, what happens is people will start bouncing from, from the app. They'll try all the, all the substitutes. And so in order to get your product off the ground into something that really does have the trajectory that, that you're looking for as a startup, um, you have to solve this cold start problem of, you know, what does it mean to go from zero to one to get enough critical mass uh, in your network in order to pull off one of, one of these strategies? So let's say you're a startup that's just getting started. What are the first steps that you should take to help achieve these network effects? Yeah, well, um, I, I want to start by, by uh, saying like what you shouldn't do, which I, right. which I talk about. Also helpful. Um, <laughs> yeah, also very helpful, yes. And, and so, um, you know, one of the most interesting things about um, you know the the dynamic at a bigger company is that when you are um, when when you're at Google and you're launching their Google Plus um, social network, when you're at um, uh, Twitter and you're trying to launch a competitor to um, to Stories or to Clubhouse or you know something like that, what you often end up doing is you think, okay, well let's just do like a really big bang strategy. Let's just get a lot of users on the platform right away. And what you end up finding is that none of these users are connected with each other, right? Um, and so you, it might look like you're getting millions of users onto, onto your new app, but instead um, what, what ends up happening is, uh, you know, they're not friends with each other, they're not connected with each other, the content isn't relevant. And I want to contrast that with um, one of the case studies I, I, I talk about in, in the book, which is Tinder. Um, which is incubated nearby at USC. Um, and I was an advisor to Tinder many years back. And, and one of the things that Sean Rad talks about is when he got the initial app off the ground, he actually, you know, the, the features were actually um, uh, exactly what you would have wanted to build. You know, they had, they had swiping, they had, you know, big pictures, they had um, all, all of the things, the necessary ingredients for what we would identify as Tinder. Now, the funny thing was then they tried to get a bunch of their friends to use it, and uh, and so um, what that meant was uh, they would just you know text all their friends, they would invite them all onto the platform, and they just found that everyone was 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 bouncing pretty much right off the bat. And the reason for that was, of course, it takes you know literally two seconds to swipe through a profile, and so people would swipe through like five profiles, and then that would be it. That would be the end of the app. And so what they realized was they needed to go and um, actually get a few hundred users that were single, that were in the right demographic, to all be on the app at the same time using the app in the right way. Um, and the way they ended up launching it was to go to USC and actually just sponsor um, uh, one, of the, um, one of the students um, from, from, uh, from the Greek system, one of their birthday parties, and they literally just 
you know, rented a mansion, got all these students into, um, uh, you know, to the party, and they posted bouncers in front the way that we would, you know, check COVID vaccine cards now, like literally have you set up your Tinder account. Um, and from that, they were able to get the first 500 users of Tinder. And, um, and then the next day, when everyone woke up and checked their phones, it was like, oh, all these people that I meant to talk to that I didn't, and like off you go. And I think that this is, just to zoom out a bit, I mean, I think this is really one of the um, really common aspects of, universal aspects of uh, companies that solve the cold start problem, which is that if you're a marketplace company, if you're Uber, you're solving it kind of city by city by city. You're not doing it kind of on a broad national basis. If you're a collaboration product like Slack, you're doing it uh, team by team by team inside of a company. Um, and you're starting out with these very small niches and with some kind of a growth hack to get things off the ground as opposed to um, trying to launch like very broadly and nationally um, you know, through PR, through Twitter, like that doesn't, that doesn't work. So apart from sponsoring like USC frat parties, what are some of the other things you could do? What did Uber do to, to get, you know, yes. off the ground? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny it, in, the, in the new Showtime um, uh, Uber TV show, they, they didn't show any of the like hustle and grind that was there in the really early days. But, um, you know, the, the, the folks very, very early on at Uber would literally go to uh, the offices of tech companies like Twitter and Pinterest and literally just pass out um, referral cards of like give $10, get $10 type, you know, referral programs for uh, to, to just get people to uh, use Uber at, you know, for their commute. Um, and they would do that. And uh, to get the driver's side, they would often go into a city and, um, and spend the first two or three months just on Craigslist, just hiring people and just trying to make it so that they would, they were guaranteed 30 bucks an hour to run the driver app, even though that there were no trips at all. Um, and, uh, and, and there was also um, all these really fun tools in the early, early years where you could set up like Uber puppy and like a truck full of puppies would come and see you and Uber ice cream and all these other things. And these were all like really amazing creative ideas that would, uh, you know, get a city off the ground. Um, and these days, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it, it doesn't move the needle because now the, all the Uber markets are so big that it's now about uh, scaling what already is working today as opposed to trying to, uh, you know, get, get the first couple of users onto the platform. And so as an investor, what metrics do you like to see in place for an early stage startup and what are some red flags? Yeah, well, um, the the most interesting thing on in investing in in startups is that most of the time I'm running into these companies when they have very very few users. Um, in in the case of uh, of Clubhouse, for example, you know I think they had 500 daily active users when we led the Series A. Substack, which is another company I know we'll we'll, we'll talk a bit more about, um, only had a few hundred writers that that were being um, that were getting going. And, and so what ends up happening in a lot of these cases is you can't actually look at the top line uh, revenue, you can't look at the actual top line metrics and try to see, okay, is it working? What, so what I tend to end up focusing on um, in, in, in the early days is to really look at the metrics around uh, retention and in particular, whether or not people are sticking around after 30 days, after 60 days, after 90 days, this like long-term uh, retentive element. Um, and then, you know, based on the framework that I was talking about earlier, if they're in multiple markets, they're in multiple demographics, I really want them to actually break apart, not just their, their aggregate metrics, but like city by city or, you know, company by company, how are they actually doing, and, or country by country, and show that they're actually, uh, uh, you know, creating amazing retention metrics across many of these smaller markets. Um, and so I care a lot about that. I care a lot about, um, for, for the consumer uh, team at A16Z, a lot of what we're uh, working on ends up being products that we prefer that people use every day, right? Um, uh, versus, you know, the FinTech team, you know, hopefully if you're investing in a new kind of insurance company, you're not using it every day, you're using it very infrequently. But, you know, for most of the products that we're working on, um, we, we want people to use it all the time. And so we'll often look at the frequency of usage. So we'll look at their daily actives versus monthly actives as a ratio. Um, and we want people to have a lot of like active days um, you know, each month. Um, we look a lot at, uh, you know, m many of these network effects driven companies 
have a notion of, they kind of have like sides of a network. And so you'll have like content creators on one side and you'll have content viewers on the other. Or in, in terms of marketplace companies, you'll have you know, drivers and riders or sellers and buyers. And so um, one of the other pieces I, I, I often think about is, well, the content creators are really the, the most valuable part of the network. The sellers are the most valuable part of the network. So how much value are they getting and how sticky is it for, for them? And because oftentimes, if you, as long as you can get, keep that side of the network really engaged, the other side you can usually acquire through paid marketing and referral programs and SEO and a lot of other things. But it's really that small group of people that create all the value, um, content creators that, that end up um, uh, you know, be, being the most valuable. So, so I focus a lot on that. So when you first invested in Substack, you said they didn't have a lot of users yet. So what was it that excited you about them and, and how are they doing? Yeah, um, so Substack is, is, yeah, it's one of my favorite companies. Um, it was a really funny one because when they, they originally went through Y Combinator, and as part of going through YC, uh, they ended up pitching me to uh, start a Substack as, as a writer. And I've, I've had a blog for, um, for almost uh, uh, 15 years now. Um, and I was like, you know, I kind of like, like my blog, so I think I'll stay, I'll, I'll stick with my thing. And I just heard more and more about them um, over time on Twitter and other, other places. And, um, and the, the reason why I ended up, after I joined Andreessen Horowitz, the reason why I ended up reaching out to them was that, um, and I'll anonymize all the, all, all the people, but um, one of my colleagues went to a major media company and, uh, and asked them, um, you know, what are, what are some of the problems that you're facing? And uh, one of the very senior executives at this, at this media company said, well, we have so many writers that are defecting to Substack, and this is like becoming a major issue. And it was just so fascinating to hear that, and that you know, we have um, folks that you know, leave, their, leave their jobs in, in, in media and journalism, they go independent, and then they're making you know, a million bucks a year um, you know, from their living room, and like, that that's actually possible as an idea is like crazy. And so, um, so I, I ended up reaching back out to the team and I think in, you know, kind of in, in the way that I examine their business, really, they are a, um, a, a company where the writers are the most important part of their network. Their writers bring all the readers. So rather than being a marketplace company, you know, they're much more kind of like a, like a Shopify you know, type, type experience where um, they really provide this infrastructure um, you know, for, for everything. And, um, and, then, and then because of that, the writers as creators end up promoting um, their subsects. And, um, and, and so this ends up being part of, you know, they're now one of the major pillars of the sort of creator economy theme because of the fact that like Patreon and, um, and OnlyFans and, um, you know, m many other of these, these uh, companies, um, the creators will, will literally put um, their Substack uh, links onto their Twitter accounts and all that, and, and that ends up being the primary distribution method. And so it was very obvious once we, um, once I started to talk with the team that they had stumbled upon something really special. Um, it was all growing, al already growing incredibly fast, um, and they were already getting some very, very interesting writers over. And so, um, you know, especially in the light of all the geopolitical stuff that's happening and a lot that's happening in the tech industry, it's just been an amazing place to, um, to, to, to consume information and to read everyone's uh, you know, everyone's thoughts on, on all these important topics. Sure, and what about Clubhouse? You were also early in them, as you mentioned. Um, how are things going there right now? What, what stage would you say they're, they're at in this trajectory that you outlined in your book? Yeah, that's right. Well, Clubhouse has had an insane first year, right? It's actually kind of amazing, but, you know, I always remind people that uh, the company has been around for, the product has been public for like a year and a half. Um, and so you can imagine going from zero to millions of active users in such a short time has been um, amazing for the company, especially when I think the, the first six months, I think the company was like 12 people. Um, uh, and, and they literally you know, couldn't do basic things like just getting um, you know, all these uh, 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 emails from celebrities in Japan that wanted to start you know, official clubhouse accounts. Like what do, you, what do you do with that when you're 12 people and no one on your staff can speak Japanese, right? Like it's a it's a real, really interesting um, you know process. So the, the the reason why we got excited about uh, Substack, uh, sorry, about Clubhouse has been that um, they really are defining this like really interesting new category. And so we had, if you have like social plus photos and like 
you know, you get you get Instagram, you get Snapchat out of that, and social plus video, you get you know all these interesting companies, and and social plus text, you get a bunch of really interesting companies. Well, you know, what can we do with audio, right? And I think if you've met Paul and Rohan, they're just um, they're just amazing founders. And so, I think the thing that they have figured out, and kind of you know the 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 way that I fit it in, and it was interesting because I was literally writing parts of the book that applied to, um, uh, to uh, Clubhouse as, as we were doing the initial investment, it's that if, if I could point at one thing that I think is very special about the company, it's that there are some people in the world that are just better at talking than they are at writing or taking photos. There's just a different set of content creators out there that, that we all know that are amazing storytellers or are incredibly um, you know, charismatic in person, but they, 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 they never write anything. And so one of the good questions is, um, shouldn't there be a platform for those people uh, to, be, to be successful and, and to find an audience? And so um, a lot of what they have been, what the, what the Clubhouse team has been building kind of post their huge boom has been, you know, now they're up to, I think, 70 something um, employees. They've obviously been well funded at this point. Um, and they're really working on how do you get um, all of these different kinds of uh, content creators, whether that's in sports or in politics or in different communities and different global communities, to all be able to build their own kind of sub-communities inside of Clubhouse. And so um, it's, a, it's a really interesting time for them. I mean, they've, they've, uh, uh, they have this base of millions of users to build on. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, we're very excited about where, what they're going to do next. So what are some of the challenges they've um, run into? I, I know it can be hard to keep up that really fast early momentum that they had. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think um, at one point they were growing 50% a week. Um, and it was, it, you know, in the early days when it was just the two founders, and I think they had maybe two other engineers, um, it was incredible that they that the whole thing didn't implode just from the sheer scaling challenges of it. Because they went from... Um, you know, 50,000 active users to uh, many, many millions uh, within within you know two months or something like that. Um, so I think that is that is a huge challenge, and just getting to a point where you can hire a team um, that can support that, and like how global do you go, and like all these things are um, are, are, are were, were just incredibly hard for them in in the first uh, six months. I think in the um, ensuing you know period, I think the big tension in the product that I think is always uh, really, really interesting is if you remember, for those of you that were on um, Clubhouse in the earliest days, it was really, it felt like actually kind of like a, you know, friends and family kind of experience. Like it was very like small rooms and I'd open the app and there was no other rooms. It would literally just be Paul Davison, the CEO. Uh, and that was it. Um, and in, in the subsequent um, uh, months, it became much more like here's a here's a celebrity that's talking about something really interesting, and it was almost more like a broadcast medium. And so I think one of the really interesting uh, product you know challenges that they that they have is how do you create a space that can um, really accommodate both. Um, and so I think that's something that the team has been thinking thinking a lot about. Um, and then you know there's and then audio is just extremely. Um, is, is, is just such an uh, interesting medium because we just, I think as a, as a group, have not really worked on it as much, right? And so we kind of know that, for example, if you're going to build a photo app, uh, photos app, that there's all sorts of, um, uh, you know, image recognition and moderation tools and things like that, um, you know, for, for photos so that you can mark things as spam or pornography or whatever. But audio is still in this stage where there's a lot of work that has to be done in order to um, uh, to 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 figure out like what what we should do in terms of um, a social network with primarily audio content, um, so anyway, so th th those are those are some of the some of the issues that I've been you know thinking about with the company. Um, and again, it's it's a year and a half in, and so it's uh, but but it's it's a really exciting company that a, a very large surprising you know group of people have uh, now now know as a brand, and so um, so yeah, it's a, it's an exciting one. So as an investor, what are some of the sectors that you're most excited about right now that you think could have good network effects? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the really big areas that, um, uh, you know, work, working in tech for a long time uh, that investors would say they would never invest in, um, there, there's always two things that would go on this list. So one was we never invest in um, online dating 
and then we never invest in video games. Those were like the two. And then amazingly enough, in, in, in the last couple of years, it's like if you had invested in Tinder and Bumble, like those would have been like actually really, really good. But for a long time, those were considered unattractive areas uh, to invest in. Similarly, you know, video games was an area where it was like, hey, this is hits driven. It's almost like you're investing in, um, in a movie at that point. Like, is that actually a good idea? Um, but I think what we've seen in the last uh, uh, decade has been that actually, if you invested in uh, Riot Games, if you if you invested in Unity or Discord or many of the both tech companies around games, as well as uh, um, as, as as well as games directly, um, what you end up finding is that actually, like, it's an awesome place to invest. And so, a lot of what I've been doing in LA um, and what brought me here um, a bunch over the, over the last couple of years, and I now have a place in LA, so I'm now spending about half my time here, has actually been. Um, doing a lot more investing in the games industry. Um, and so this is a big effort at um, A16Z. We've hired quite a few investors uh, from who are native to the industry to, to join the team. And our goal is really to be able to invest in what we consider now um, uh, what might be like the next major form of social network, which is if you look at where uh, kids and young adults are spending their time, they're spending so much time in Roblox and in Minecraft and in Fortnite. Um, and these are real-time environments where they're um, hanging out with your friends. Um, and, and we really think that, that it has the potential to be um, you know, that next social experience that can then create a uh, you know, billion monthly actives product that can then be the next, um, uh, you know, the next Instagram or the next um, Snapchat will, be, will look more like that. And so that's a huge area of, of, uh, uh, that, that I've um, been spending my time on about half my time now. Um, and then I think uh, one of the really um, compelling parts about being a founder in LA, I've, what, one, one of the things that um, I've, I've argued is that over the last two years with uh, the, the prevalence of remote work and a lot of what's been happening, um, LA and New York are probably the major winners in uh, being able to attract founders in, in a big way. And uh, probably not Miami, probably not Austin. Like probably, uh, like I, I, I would estimate, um, most of it is is New York and LA that is the beneficiary. With um, obviously San Francisco remaining a big critical mass area, but but something where um, it may it may be less important over time. And so within LA, one of the the big things for, for founders has been being able to work at the intersection of entertainment and creators and um, and and a lot of that bringing that together in tech. Um, is, is, is a big area. And so looking not just at Substack, but many of the other infrastructure companies that, that, that are available. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.